Welcome everybody to uh, this equipping hour. I am gonna pray and then we'll we'll dive in. God, it is a blessing and a privilege to be here this morning to be with your people, to be known by you, to be able to know you in a saving way. God, I pray for the men and women who are just arriving, who are uh, sitting in the worship center, um, hearing this instruction this morning and eager to hear from your word and glean from your wisdom, God. You tell us that if we cry out for wisdom, if we raise our voice for understanding, if we humbly and diligently pursue your wisdom, that we will have the fear of the Lord and we will find the knowledge of God, uh, that by engaging with, in that kind of pursuit of wisdom, that we'll have uh, an understanding of righteousness and justice and equity every single good path that you intend for us. Even as I think about Grace Bible Church and uh, the 20 years of grace that you've shown to us and establishing this church and uh, maintaining this church and uh, gifting this church with pastors and teachers who aid in sanctifying the body. Uh, We just thank you for those things, God, and ask that you would use the activities of of this Sunday to continue the work that you've started among us, that we would experience your kindness and the ability uh, to receive your word with clarity. Help me to be clear as I articulate these truths and make us a church that is better equipped to honor you as we think about our discipleship relationships, as we think about counseling, and as we think about the connection that that has uh, to everything else that goes on in the church, God. I pray that it would be an encouragement, it would be clarifying, and that you would use it to strengthen our resolve to work alongside you and what you desire to do at Grace Bible Church. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Recently for Mother's Day, I bought Emily a pair of uh, AirPod Pros. Her phone is on the fritz and thought it would be a good idea to get her some uh, AirPods that she could actually use to listen to music and talk on the phone since not much else on her phone is working. That was the cheaper option. And, uh, you know, being the generous husband that I am, the first place that I looked for AirPods was (laughs) OfferUp. And uh, I found somebody selling, claiming to sell an authentic pair of AirPod Pros. Um, for a really good price. And it turned out that they had more than one pair. And so, being the good husband that I am, I bought myself a pair for Mother's Day. (laughs) And uh, I remember uh, a friend of mine telling me that he he bought, uh, or he got duped, you know, buying a pair on OfferUp, and I thought, I don't want to be that guy. So I did some research on how you spot fake AirPods, um, even called this friend back up and said, hey, would you remind me, um, you know, give me some insight into this purchase I'm about to make? Um, so I followed his instructions, met this person, looked up the serial number, everything checked out, and I thought, this is amazing. Two pairs of AirPod Pros, for less than half the price of one pair. (laughs) I know, you can see where this is going. Like, what were you thinking? I know, 
Well, uh, my opinion about, about those things changed recently when I went into the store to uh, actually get one of them replaced. Um, and I put the case on the counter on the Genius Bar. And as soon as the lady picked them up, she said, where'd you get these again? <laughs> I know. Don't tell me they're, they're not authentic. And she said, yeah, I can tell as soon as I, I picked them up. You can tell by the way it opens and the light. And she opened it. She took an AirPod Pro out. She said, usually ours look like this. The color's off. I mean, there are so many signs. Um, you know, I should have known weeks earlier when I was having trouble pairing them, when uh, I tried to change the, the tip and pulled the whole half, half of the, the shell off of one. Those should have been telltale signs when other people were having trouble hearing me. I mean, they looked authentic, and yet there were signs along the way they just didn't work quite right. There were just little indications along the way and the way that they worked that they weren't the real thing. Uh, when I bought a new pair earlier this week, uh, after finding out those were fake, um, I was sitting in my car and connecting them before I left the mall, and I put uh, the second pair in while I'm sitting in my car with the air at full blast. And all of a sudden, the, I couldn't hear the air anymore. And I thought, oh no, something's wrong with my car. This is terrible. <laughs> um, and so I took the air pod out to check the AC and I heard it again. And I thought, no way. This is what it's like to have a real pair of AirPod Pros, the noise cancellation uh, feature. Just with a swipe of a button, you can let the noise from outside the earpod, uh, earbuds come through. And with the swipe of a button, you can uh, turn off all the noise outside of the, the device. And I thought, wow, this is uh, an astonishing difference those looked real, but they could not duplicate the same quality and the same features of the real deal. Uh, biblical counseling done outside of the local church is similar to that. You can have all the right principles of biblical counseling. You can open God's word and instruct people from God's word on the truths that exist in God's word and yet if it doesn't have the right context, if it's not being done in the right context with the right ecclesiology to back the biblical counseling that you're giving, the end product, unfortunately, in the counselee is gonna show. You just cannot reduplicate outside of God's ordained context the same end product, the same quality. And over the past 40 to 50 years, thankfully, we've been recovering uh, the glory of the sufficiency of Scripture, that doctrine. And as that's been happening, more and more men and women are getting trained to do biblical counseling, help people with their problems, with their Bibles open, to explain and teach these biblical principles. But as more and more men and women are getting trained to do this, many of them uh, seem to be willing to do this outside of the context and authority of the local church. Biblical counseling agencies that operate independent from any local church, they train and certify men and women who then establish counseling centers that operate independent of any local church. And then those counseling centers counsel men and women without any oversight or accountability to the local church. Have you ever considered 
the question, to whom did God give the authority to even counsel? Who does God give that authority to to counsel? Who, is God, who has God's approval to shepherd or provide spiritual care for Christ's sheep? If, as we discussed last week, counseling is really just another name for instructing, warning, admonishing, right, putting into the mind uh, what a Christian needs to know in order to mature in Christ and please God, to whom has God given the authority to oversee that process or given the responsibility to shepherd others in the spiritual sense? And the answers to that question is undoubtedly the local church. Go to Matthew 28. We'll see this in Jesus' parting words as Matthew records it. Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 16. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Verse 18 tells us that Jesus, and from Jesus' perspective, his own authority that had been given to him, all authority in heaven and on earth, that's all authority possible, any authority to be had belongs to King Jesus. And what command from the, that authority does he then, then give them? It is to go, therefore, and make disciples, not just of the Jews, which he actually did instruct them earlier in, in Matthew chapter 10. He said, don't go to the G Gentiles, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Here, that commission is expanded, and he says, all the peoples, all the nations, the Gentiles. What they're supposed to do, these leaders of what soon will be the church, is to make disciples of all those nations. That's an impossible task for these 11. And yet this is the command from King Jesus. How are they supposed to make disciples? Well, by baptizing them. And verse 20, by teaching them. That's everything to obey everything that Jesus commanded. That process of making a disciple and reduplicating uh, the disciple-making process belongs to the church. These leaders of Christ's church, the apostles, what they did with this command as they obediently um, submitted to this great commission was they established the church and then they commissioned leaders of the church. They baptized and they imparted the doctrine of Christ to local churches. That's your New Testament. The letters were all written to local churches or members of them and they reduplicated the process. They made more disciples. And here we are in Tempe, Arizona as the blessed results of their labors. The responsibility belongs to the local church, not to 
parachurch ministries, not to seminaries, not to biblical counseling uh, training centers or counseling centers or biblical counseling organizations, not to college campus ministries. No one else has the, the authority from Jesus to actually fulfill this great commission. Certainly, organizations outside of the local church, parachurch organizations can participate with the church to accomplish this, but they don't have the authority to be autonomous in this pursuit. And if it's a good parachurch organization, biblical counseling ministry, college campus ministry, seminary, etc., then it will find itself not in competition to the local church, but in submission to the local church and hindering the local church. The church is the only institution on earth that Christ has entrusted with this, this task. And so if this is true, if the church alone has been entrusted with this privilege and duty to disciple, counsel, shepherd, and care for the church, care for Christians, then what must be present in the life of a church for an effective counseling ministry amongst the members? That's a crucial question to answer. If this is the church's obligation, our duty and privilege, as we're calling it, then what has to be present in the life of a ministry in order to make that endeavor actually work? In order to be successful in that pursuit, what has to be present? If each member is supposed to be participating in the instruction and encouragement and admonishment of the other members, then we need to think carefully about what must be true of us corporately. And so that's what I want to do this morning, is to give us six practices that must be present in a local church in order for biblical counseling to flourish. That's uh, our, our outline for this morning, is that biblical counseling flourishes amidst six ecclesiological practices. Ecclesiological practices, practices of the church. Now, let me just be clear that these six practices, these don't ensure, <laughs> these don't ensure that each member uh, stepping into the other member's lives with the truth is doing it faithfully, right? This, if these things are present, in other words, that doesn't mean all of us is counseling biblically. But these are things that have to be present if we're going to successfully counsel one another biblically. You take any one of these away, and biblical counseling, disciple-making, the very thing that Jesus gave us to do, is going to be hindered or rendered impossible. And you have those things up for you on the outline. And we'll just tackle these one by one. First, corporate instruction. Corporate instruction, that is the preaching and teaching of the local church. We see this uh, implied, commanded, rather, in Matthew 28, what we just read. Essential to the disciple-making process is teaching. It is teaching. And you see the apostles, after this commission by Jesus is given, faithfully carrying this out. They are known throughout the book of Acts for this, just like Jesus was. Uh, Mark 10 tells us that Jesus, it calls it his custom to teach the people. It was his custom. You don't even have that being said uh, in that way about the miracles he performed, right? There's, those are easy to notice the miracles that Jesus is performing, the good deeds that he's doing. He's feeding multitudes, healing the sick, raising the dead, giving sight where there is none. And yet Mark identifies it as uh, what was his custom, though, was teaching. That is what 
he came to do, uh, is proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, as well as accomplish the salvation necessary for men and women to enter it. But teaching was Jesus' custom. And the apostles, being good disciples of Jesus, the ultimate disciple, uh, discipler, they followed in his footsteps and did the very same thing. They didn't get distracted with other things. No apostle established a parachurch ministry because the church wasn't doing its job to uh, fill a hole in the church because the church just couldn't get it right. And so they launched out on, you know, peterministries.com, right? They didn't have that because the church wasn't doing its job. They labored in the local church to do the very thing that Jesus had called them to do. Jesus' enemies, this was even clear to the enemies of the church. Go to Acts chapter 4. It wasn't the good works of the church that the enemies of the church had a problem with. It was specifically the teaching and preaching that was happening coming from the local church, the gospel proclamation, and what they were doing with the truth that was an issue for the church's enemies. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Jump down to verse 13. Again, you see the same, you see the religious leader take issue with the same thing, verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were educated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What should we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to not stop doing miracles, but let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them to do just that, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. This is where the power of the first church was. It was in its preaching, in its teaching, in its faithful gospel proclamation. Essential to the disciples, the apostles making more disciples, was their teaching ministry. If they failed at this point, they would not be effective disciple makers. If we fail at Grace Bible Church to instruct, to teach, to preach, and to do all of those things at a high level, accurately, clearly, consistently, then we will fail to make disciples. The church, every disciple of Christ is a learner. As you think about uh, being on the receiving end of what the church is called to do in teaching and in preaching, uh, 
if you're a disciple of Christ, that means you're a learner. That's what the word simply means. You're learning in order to follow in the footsteps of someone else. Being a faithful disciple means that you're consistently and eagerly sitting under, under the instruction of God's word. Um, knowing what a principal place, preaching plays, uh, teaching plays in the life of the local church, that should make us all anticipate Sundays when these activities primarily take place. We should look forward to being here on Sundays. We should pray for the men teaching on Sundays that when they open up God's word, they would be clear that throughout the week, they would be uh, adequately preparing amidst all of the other things that the, that the elders are doing. And this should make us eager to submit ourselves and gain understanding when God's word is opened from the pulpit. And that's just a few of the times that teaching happens in the corporate gathering. Martin Lloyd-Jones had this to say about preaching. The work of preaching is the highest and the greatest and the most glorious calling to which anyone can ever be called. The most urgent need in the Christian church today is true preaching. And it is the greatest and the most urgent need in the church. It, or as it is the greatest and the most urgent need in the church, it is obviously the greatest need in the world also. The world doesn't need anything more than robust, faithful preaching. That is what transforms. Jesus prayed that in John 17, 17, sanctify them with your truth, your word is truth. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll see Paul's uh, emphasis in a couple more passages when it comes to preaching and teaching. It's interesting to note that in 1 Timothy 2, he starts off chapter 2 by saying, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. That's chapter 2, verse 1. First of all, that's after a whole chapter of instruction that he says, first of all. Clearly, it's not the first thing he said, but in terms of the church's engagement in this fight for the souls of believers and unbelievers, right, people to be saved into the church, people who are in the church to be established and built up, Prayer is of primary importance in Paul's mind, that uh, properly wielding that weapon, if you will, in that fight for souls. But the instruction that he gives sort of as a prelude to the first instructions has to do with dealing with false teachers, with error. It's almost like if I don't deal, if you don't deal with, Timothy, the false teaching that's happening in the church, then nothing else you do matters. Unless the teaching and the preaching is faithful, if the teaching that's happening in Ephesus doesn't stop, according to verse 4, producing speculation, then nothing else you teach matters. Nothing else you do as a church is going to matter. Look back at chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrine. What do false teachers in the church need? They don't need something other than teaching. They need instruction. They need teaching. These men, according to verse 4, are also not to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than what biblical teaching should be doing, furthering the administration of God, which is by faith, i.e. instructing 
according to verse 5, the goal of our instruction is just that, love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's what biblical instruction is supposed to be doing, not giving, uh, not encouraging speculation, but actually giving answers that help the body to love one another. And not just any kind of love, not love that comes from any kind of life, but a purity of heart, a goodness of conscience, and a sincerity of faith. Biblical instruction accomplishes that. When you come on Sunday, you should look forward to having your heart purified, having your conscience improved, made better, and having your faith challenged to become more sincere. When you sit under biblical instruction, those things should happen. All so that you can more effectively love others. Preaching and teaching, faithful preaching and teaching accomplishes that. And so you should look forward to that happening. That, a church where that is happening, is going to aid biblical counseling in a myriad of ways. A robust pulpit ministry, a robust teaching ministry is going to aid those who are seeking to counsel biblically, as well as those who are being counseled. Just think that the one who is gaining a deeper knowledge of Scripture because of consistently sitting under the Word when it's preached, um, being attentive and prayerfully dependent on the Spirit to work in you while you listen, that person will get to know passages that they haven't perhaps studied. They haven't studied as deeply as the men who are spending all week preparing, hopefully. And all of that is going to be useful as you counsel others, as you seek to step into the lives of other people and instruct them Every Sunday, you should be adding to your counseling tool belt because of what's taught when you sit under God's word. And if you're here for equipping hour, which all of you are, then you're doubling up on the tools, on the equipping that you have now to step into the lives of others. And it's even appropriate to think of yourself as being counseled from the pulpit. You're being instructed. Those counseling words that we looked at last week, that's happening even as you listen. And so if you're a good counselee, for example, and if you faithfully listen to the word, then you know what it's like to be counseled from the word because that's happening every time you sit under the instruction of the word. And so even that becomes better equipping for you to step into the lives of others. In his book, Expository Sanctification, Paul Shirley says this, sure, there are multiple factors that contribute to the process of sanctification, but a congregation simply cannot grow beyond the maturity of the preaching they sit under. God designed the preaching of his word to mature his people And when his word is not faithfully proclaimed from the pulpit, there will not be consistent growth in the pew. Poor preaching stunts growth in sanctification. And to think for a second about counseling outside of the context of the local church, if you sought to take spiritual responsibility as a discipler, as a Counselor, not in a passing way, right? A problem comes up and you offer biblical counsel in that moment. But if you taught, sought a formal role as a discipler for someone who was not sitting under faithful preaching, then your good counsel would actually be undermined by the unfaithful preaching they were sitting under. The best thing you could do for someone who was sitting under unfaithful preaching, unbiblical preaching, 
your counsel would be good if you encourage them to find biblical preaching, to find faithful preaching where whoever you or whoever was counseling them, that counsel could actually flourish because it was being assisted by the faithful proclamation of the word. That's what it's like to do biblical counseling, biblical, biblical counseling in the context of the local church. An organization or a ministry that said, we're just going to counsel, um, we're not going to worry about uh, where, where people are coming from, uh, we're not going to seek to partner with churches, but we're, we're going to encourage pastors to refer their sheep to us so that we can do their counseling for them. Um, the pastor's not involved in the process. It's just a, a handoff and, hey, you go do that work. Those ministries uh, actually fail to use God's ordained means of sanctification in the life of the people they're claiming to counsel. The biblical counselor who knows all the right passages, for example, to instruct a married couple and doesn't bother with their involvement in a local church. Maybe they're in an unfaithful church, but this counselor or this organization is willing to do that church's counseling for them when it comes to marriage issues. Their good counsel, perhaps, on marriage is going to be undermined by the bad church's practical ecclesiology. We looked at Ephesians 4. The body, God says, causes the growth of the body. And as we saw in Ephesians 4, what Paul has in mind is a body overseen by elders, the gifts that he's given to that church to carry out the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. God intends that the members of that church to sanctify the other members of that church. A counselor with good intentions to love people and be helpful can practically undermine their good counsel by convincing the counselee that the church isn't necessary for counseling, for sanctification, that the bad preaching that they're under isn't necessary, for example. And so those things become hindrances to what otherwise would be faithful biblical counseling. Just to conclude the comments on the preaching and teaching, when does this happen at Grace Bible Church? Preaching and teaching. Obviously, we've mentioned uh, main services and equipping hour. So you get to be counseled every week. You sit in an equipping hour and in the main service from God's word. You're admonished, you're warned, you're encouraged, you're comforted, you're instructed. Those are all good things. Uh, soon Sunday evening services will be added next month. And so that's another layer of equipping that you'll be able to receive. Uh, not as a substitute for equipping hour or main service, but as an additional instruction. And then think about the other ministries where teaching is involved. Next generation ministries, small groups on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Uh, in build, teaching happens every other Saturday for about nine months of the year. In Wellspring on Thursdays and on Saturdays every other week. And then there's Wellspring Kids on Thursdays. I can't tell you how many times our kids have mentioned things that they've learned. Uh, and I thought, we haven't talked about that. Oh yeah, you're remembering the snack. That's right. Those things are helpful. Uh, the trust on Friday mornings for about nine months of the year in 414 every other Friday night on Friday mornings. The men in 414 meet at Sagebrush. Uh, on Saturday mornings, the women meet from 414, the ladies and the leaders. In student ministries every other week, preaching and teaching is taking place. Keepers and, and defenders of the faith 
on those same nights that student ministries meets every other week in BCEV, our uh, counseling ministry, counseling training ministry. Right now, we're about every other Monday or so. We're in our fundamentals class, uh, further equipping people to counsel. There's an upcoming conflict resolution and reconciliation class. You can talk to me or Tom if you're interested to know more about that. The expositor seminary, when classes are taking place in the spring and in the fall, there are men being equipped uh, by our shepherds, by churches that we partner with in the TES network so that they can handle God's word at a high level. All of those are times when formal teaching, formal preaching is taking place. And so we should never get tired because we understand the role that this plays in us being effective disciples. We should never get tired of sitting under the preaching and teaching of God's word. John Owen says, a man doesn't get bored of hearing God's word until he's bored of practicing it. We should have that attitude. Another uh, essential ecclesiological practice so that biblical counseling would flourish is shepherding care. Shepherding care. This is closely associated with the teaching and preaching ministry of the church. But the shepherding care, what I mean by that is that the leaders, the elders of a church are actually carrying out the shepherding work of of the flock. This is what Peter requires of elders in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Do this, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to their, your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And then the hope for those elders, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Shepherd the flock among you. Not any, anybody else's flock, but the flock among you is what all the elders are called to shepherd. The duties of the church's shepherds are briefly outlined here. So that includes a, a caring for and a management um, in the various members of Christ's flock that's in a particular congregation. Obviously, preaching and teaching would be a subset of that shepherding that goes on. But we shouldn't also miss verse 3. Another aspect of shepherding the flock among you is not lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock, Ex exemplifying godliness is also a subset of caring for the flock and shepherding. That's also crucial to successful biblical counseling is actually as you pour into disciples for them to have a window into your own life to see you live out godliness. This was uh, one of the unfortunate errors that had to be overturned by, uh, the, or during the Reformation. All, none of the, the pastors at the time, if everybody's a monk who's leading God's church and nobody's married, then the church for a long time didn't see what it was like for a pastor to love his wife, uh, for men to care for their children, right? Now, we should see those things, even as you think about being an effective discipler, let people see your life so that they're close enough to see godliness work itself out in 
the relationships that are closest to you, even in your home. Um, you can do this by bringing people who you're discipling along with you when you're perhaps involved in a more formal counseling opportunity so that the other person can see how you're counseling. That can be useful. Um, if you want to become better equipped to, counselor, uh, to counsel, to be a biblical counselor, ask those who you know who are discipling if you can tag along. That's a good idea, and you can see it up close and, and personal. Thinking about a, a church without this shepherding care, obviously we've said the, the elders aren't modeling godliness if this kind of shepherding care isn't there or if the shepherds of a church are actually abdicating their responsibility as shepherds, um, giving their counseling responsibility to an outside agency. If that's the case, um, if, a, if a counselor or a pastor is counseling, constantly referring out, churches who do that, pastors who do that, uh, really nothing more will happen than uh, damage control in counseling. You really won't end up doing preventative counseling if that's the case. Uh, you won't be able to train men and women how to disciple others if this shepherding care and modeling isn't happening. Jay Adams had strong opinions about churches where this kind of shepherding care wasn't happening, where pastors were giving away their uh, responsibility of counseling. He says, when the pastor of a congregation may claim that his ministry keeps him too busy to counsel, as some do, his claim is always false. Surely he could not be much busier at the Lord's work than the Lord Jesus, who found so much time to counsel individuals, or even the Ap Apostle Paul, who followed his Lord's example in this. If the pastor really is too busy, and that claim is not merely an excuse, if that's the case, then something is radically wrong. He must examine his activities to discover what it is that is keeping him so busy, because surely it is not to be the ministry of the word. This kind of shepherding care is able to make truly biblical counseling flourish. Also, Briefly, leadership development. Leadership development is crucial to successful, enduring biblical counseling. Um, if the church is never taught, if the men of the church are never raised up so that the next generation of leaders is, has the same biblical convictions, the same commitments to biblical counseling that might exist in one generation, then your biblical counseling ministry is going to be short-lived, or the good convictions you have for biblical counseling are going to be short-lived. I'm thankful for this church's commitment to that. Obviously, we've had multiple, can I say multiple generations of elders? Is that fair enough? I think that's fair enough. Multiple generations of elders raised up in this church. Most of the elders who are elders have been homegrown, so to speak. That's a good plan to keep our uh, convictions for a long time and to see them play out over time. Also, number four, church membership. Church membership is important to flourishing biblical counseling and discipleship. This might seem like an, uh, an odd thing to include on this list, how does church membership aid in the discipleship process? Let me give you two reasons. Uh, can you imagine walking with someone in a discipleship relationship and over time instructing them how to please the Lord if they were never baptized? According to Jesus, baptism is the first step into a discipleship relationship. The person who, for example, because membership is, uh, or baptism is required for membership, 
So it's helpful by formalizing membership like we do here at Grace Bible Church to know that members have been baptized. They've ha- they have taken the first step on the path of discipleship with Jesus. And anyone who's unwilling to do that would by implication be telling you, I can't be discipled by you. You can't walk with me several steps down the discipleship path because I'm unwilling to take the first step in baptism. And that's why in the first century, baptism was so crucial, right? They didn't have to have a class on what baptism is because it was that costly to be baptized. And so the the guardrails, the boundaries around entrance into the church and into discipleship got to be baptism, a public declaration that you are identifying with Jesus, that a man who was killed by the religious leaders and hated by the Jews, (laughs) you're going to get baptized in front of them as a testimony that you are publicly identifying with him and his people. And so for us, church membership, at least for starters, functions as an entrance uh, into discipleship. You're, you, they are telling you by be- their ability even to become a member, I am on the same page with the leaders and the other members of this church and eager to submit to the teaching of this church. If formal membership, uh, if someone's unwilling or unable because of doctrinal reasons, because of uh, how shepherding happens, because of the biblical convictions that we love, if they're unwilling or, or unable to be a formal member, then that would at least be good reason to think I should make those doctrinal issues the counseling agenda. The things that are prohibiting you from becoming a member should become the priority in counseling. Now, obviously, there can be good reasons for not being a member uh, for a time. And so when that's the case, which it oft- oftentimes it is, uh, the, the shepherds want to patiently walk with someone uh, through those issues until membership is, is a reality. And so by doing that, we actually reinforce our commitment to the other things that we've already mentioned, uh, the, the shepherding care. We want to take responsibility for the sheep among us. That practically means our members. Those are the ones who have said, I want the leaders of this church and the other members to covenant with me, to care for me, and vice versa. Sign me up. I want that kind of care. And so we care for each other in the ways that we've agreed to that are biblical. Finally, just briefly, with the time we have left, these final two, uh, biblical fellowship also enables biblical counseling to flourish. It's interesting to to think about agencies outside of the local church who do biblical counseling. They'll often encourage people coming to their organization to bring an advocate, someone who knows you, who can walk with you, Um, really what they're aiming for is some semblance of biblical fellowship. Somebody else who can walk with you, who's going to be involved in your life outside of the counseling room, who can reinforce these same principles. Well, if your counseling is done in the context of the local church, if the person that you're walking with is involved in a small group here on Sundays, serving in various capacities, just formally, and then informally 
they love being with the body, then those would all be opportunities for biblical fellowship to take place. Not just hanging out, being entertained, doing some uh, inconsequential activity that we both enjoy, but actually aiming at stimulating one another toward loving good deeds. Uh, that's what I mean by biblical fellowship. The interaction that's happening between members of the body is intentionally aiming at an increase in godliness. Excuse me. Um, when discipleship happens, while that is going on, while the person that you're discipling, the person that you're counseling, they don't just come to you as the expert once a week, once every other week, because you're a quote-unquote biblical counselor. But they have you as a resource who's maybe taking the lead in their spiritual formation, in their discipleship, and you're counseling them maybe on a particular issue but they've got all the added resources of the church around them in their small group, in the ministries that they're serving in, and et cetera, available to them. And so biblical fellowship that's happening when they're not with you is actually helping the biblical instruction that you're giving them. And then finally, church discipline. Without church discipline, biblical counseling really has no recourse but to be good advice. Uh, there was a time where I was still formulating these convictions and counseling others regularly outside of our church. And this was a constant reality that these people were involved in churches without unwilling, rather, to practice church discipline and so all I could do was dispense good counsel. And if they insisted on, on sin, I could stop counsel, but there was no recourse to actually help them repent. I sat down with uh, one man's pastor who was in this situation when he made it clear he was going to pursue an unbiblical divorce. I mean, we had been counseling for several meetings, several weeks. And when I met with his pastor and talked to him about what was going on, uh, his pastor was not well aware. And when he acknowledged it was an unbiblical divorce, and I opened up to Matthew 18, it was almost like the first time that he had read it but he acknowledged it was the right thing to do. And at the end of the day, was still unwilling. Not that all of that time spent was worthless. Certainly God uses what he will. But for someone who's in a church not going to practice church discipline, uh, it's better to counsel when you have the God-ordained means available, like church discipline to produce repentance. Um, and you can write down Matthew 18, you sure, uh, most of you probably know it already. That implies that counseling is happening, right? If he listens, you have won your brother. If he listens implies that he has heard an admonishment, a warning, some sort of instruction. And so those who are counseling biblically may find themselves at various times involved in what's described as church discipline in Matthew 18. And that will only aid you in faithfully counseling others. We have to be committed to these things. And even as you think about how these aid in biblical counseling, uh, be eager to see each of these components in the life of our church improve that we would excel still more in all of these ways, because as we do, we become better counselors and disciples of one another. God, thank you so much for 
establishing this church, for being faithful to us and knowing what we need even better, better than we know those things ourselves. Help us to be faithful and to pursue sanctification, to pursue growing up all together uh, on your terms, God. Help us to identify inconsistencies where we may be inconsistent. Uh, help us to be more zealous to see you glorified in these ways. And we pray that you would, not for our sake, but for your own name's sake, for your own glory, that you would give us much success in all of our labors. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.